Great to see everybody. Great to see you. I'm glad to see the revolution is continuing. Well, we have first seen uh, some of the results of the revolution of a few years ago, and that was last year's election. I understand we had a few new members sent to Congress, and we have you to thank you for. But I do want to take a moment to take a little special privilege and say we also had a new senator from Kentucky, and we like that too. So there's a lot of exciting things going on. There is truly a revolution going on in this country, and we've been dealing with this and encouraging it because I do believe that we live in a time where we do need a change in attitude, a change in ideas. We don't need to just change the political parties. We need to change our philosophy about what this country is all about. You know, this past week, we had a pretty good uh, victory for the freedom movement. We had a vote come up all of a sudden under suspension, and it had to do with the Patriot Act. And the Patriot Act, the Patriot Act, we know, is, uh, has nothing to do with patriotism. They always name it opposite of what it is. The Patriot Act is literally the destruction of the Fourth Amendment. That's what it's all about. Now, the one thing in Washington they haven't quite understood is what's happening in grassroots America because they assumed that everybody loved the Patriot Act. We'll bring it up under suspension and pass it automatically. Well, we didn't get a majority vote, but they didn't pass it automatically with a two-third vote, sending a message that this country is waking up and we want to protect our civil liberties as well as our economic liberties. This week I was scheduled to be on a financial program. I've been on a few of those lately, talking about things like the Federal Reserve and a few other things. But I, I never got around to talking about this program this week about the Federal Reserve because uh, all of a sudden there was a speech be given, uh, given by Mubarak about his potential resignation. Of course, he resigned today. So that was the subject. But. Uh, a lot of people now say, what should our position be? What should our position be about finding the next dictator of e Egypt? And I would say, we need to do a lot less, a lot sooner, not only in Egypt, but around the world. You know, some, some people want to argue with us about that and say we have a moral responsibility to spread our goodness around the world and it's our obligation uh, to do this. But let me tell you, fiscal conservatives should look at this carefully. How much did we invest in that dictator over the past 30 years? $70 billion we invested in Egypt. And guess what? The government is crumbling and the people are upset, not only with their government, but they're upset with us for propping up that puppet dictator for all those years. Yeah. Now, to add insult to injury, where do you think the money went? To Swiss bank account. That family, the Mubarak family, has 40, 50, 60 billion dollars, nobody knows, stashed away in other countries, other areas. Of your money, and that is true. Now, you know, it used to be that conservatives were against foreign aid. I'm still against foreign aid for everybody. a saying that I've used to describe foreign aid. Foreign aid is taking money from the poor people of a rich country and giving it to the rich people of a poor country. And there, and there can't be a better example of that than what we did with Egypt. We took money from you, made people poor, it contributed to our debt, 
billions and billions of dollars and all we get is chaos from it and, and, and instability. There's nothing wrong with what the founders talked about. They talked about having friendships and trading, getting along with people and staying out of the entangling alliance and the internal affairs of foreign nations when it's none of our business. We've been doing it for a long time, and you get periods of relative stability. There was relative stability when we were uh, propping up the Shah, but it ended up with a bad results. We ended up with the Ayatollah, and now we have a problem on our hands. But all the Middle East is un unstable because of this. Now it's Tunisia, now it's, next it's Egypt, and it's going to keep going because all the problems are there because the people don't like us propping up their dictators no more than we would like it if a foreign country came in here and propped up a dictator in our country. But the real danger is that this will most likely spread, and when it gets to Saudi Arabia and there's disruption there, then you are going to see some real problems. And it will be a partial consequence of our flawed foreign policy, and temporary stability does not guarantee stability that we need around the world. And besides, we just flat out don't have the money, and we shouldn't be doing it. Just remember, the uh, Soviet system did not collapse because we had to fight them. They collapsed for economic reasons. Guess where their final uh, plunge was uh, uh, in, in their, on their uh, empire? Afghanistan. So it makes no sense for us to think that we can keep troops in 135 countries, 900 bases, and think we can do it forever. So no matter how badly you want us to do that, it's time to reassess that foreign policy. It's time for us to bring troops home. We've had troops in Japan since World War II and in Germany. Why are, they, why are we paying for their defense? Now, you know, um, there's a lot, been a lot of talk about the budget deficit, and uh, that's, that's something that I was concerned about, you know, just a few years back, like 1976. <laughs> and that's why I haven't voted for any appropriation bills during that period of time either. But people are starting to recognize it's bad, you know, we have to do something about it, we have to have a balanced budget amendment, all these things. But, you know, uh, the, unfortunately, is even in spite of the improvement in the Congress right now, we don't have the votes, which is tragic. It's going to continue. And we're going to continue to bail out. We're going to continue to spend the money. Nobody wants to cut. I am sure that half the people in this room won't cut one penny out of the military. And the military is not equated to defense. Defense spending is one thing. Military spending is what Eisenhower called the military industrial complex, and we have to go after that. Let's say government, as you all, I am sure, would agree, is out of control, and it's very hard for us to get a handle on it. So let's say we even theoretically, and a miracle happened, and we balance the budget where we are today. It would be still a disaster because we're spending too much money, but it wouldn't change a whole lot. When a crisis comes, guess what happens? Guess who does the bailing out? The Federal Reserve used $4 billion to pass out without congressional approval, and most people say, oh, well, that's the Federal Reserve's job to do that. No, it is our job to check up and find what the Federal Reserve has done, audit them, and find out who their buddies are that they're taking care of.
The Federal Reserve creates money out of thin air. They can loan to banks, central banks of the world, to other governments and international financial institutions, and we're not even allowed to know. They, they resent the fact that when I ask these questions that they don't have to give us information. That's why the bill to audit the Fed is the first step to ending the Federal Reserve. <laughs> But the Federal Reserve will end itself because they will destroy the dollar. Since the Fed came into existence since 1913, they've eliminated 98% of the value of the 1913 dollar, and it's continual erosion. They pumped up at first when the crisis hit $1.2 trillion, another $600 billion, and believe me, there is an economic law that says you just can't continue to do this. So Congress has a responsibility, they should cut back, but Congress has a responsibility to protect the value of the currency, and that means that we have the moral and the legal authority to put checks on the Federal Reserve System. You know, there's a... Uh, there's been a lot of, lot of talk about bipartisanship after the election. We need bipartisanship. And, uh, you know, in some ways that might be true, but I'll tell you what I think about it. Yeah. I think and I believe that we've had way too much bipartisanship for about 60 years. Yeah. You know, we have, we have bipartisanship on... Uh, bipartisanship on medical care. You say, yeah, you know, the, the current administration has given us bad new medical care, but what is done on the other administration? We've been involved for a long time. It's, it's the bipartisanship of the welfare system, the warfare system, the monetary system, the challenge to our civil liberties. It all goes through with support from both parties. So there's way too much bipartisanship. This should be a challenge of the issue of philosophy, good philosophy versus bad philosophy. And when, you can, and when you can agree on something, you should make coalitions with whomever will uh, agree with you and come, and, and come together. But I'd like to see some bar bipartisanship, though. What I would like to see is take those big government conservatives who love to spend money and never cut their efforts and their spending and get the big government liberals where they want to spend and never want to cut and let them get together and say, you know, it's time, you know, this deficit is good. Let's have a little bit of bipartisanship and cut both. There's been, uh, there's been talk lately about American exceptionalism. Man, we like to talk about that. I think uh, we, we certainly live in an exceptional country. We have been blessed. It's been the greatest country, most freedom, most prosperity. My concern is I'm afraid we're losing it. I'm afraid we've given up on our devotion to liberty. That's where our problem is. But you know where I think we go astray on this exceptionalism is there's some people, and sometimes they're re referred to as neoconservatives, and they're sort of neo-Jacobins, where, where they believe that we have this moral responsibility to, to use force to go around the world and say, you will do it our way or else. Well, force doesn't work. It never works. The best way the best way to get people to act more like us if we're doing a good job is for us to have a sound economy, a sound dollar, treat people decently, have a foreign policy that makes common sense, treat people like we want to be treated, and then maybe they would want to emulate us and say, freedom does work and we ought to try it. But we can't force it on other people. You know, there's one general rule about what we should expect from government. There is, uh, the First Amendment is a great amendment. Freedom of expression is protected. The government shall write no laws in reference to our freedom of expression. It doesn't say that we are to have an expression of only the non-controversial ideas. It's freedom of expression. Now, most people are pretty good on the First Amendment, but where they slip up is they say the government should, spend, should write no laws about the freedom of activity. 
So they want to tell, because the liberals want to talk about how to regulate your economic activity and how you spend your money, and others want to regulate your personal lifestyle. But it's, government should not be regulating us, and we should adapt one other principle for that to work. We should all swear off the use of violence against our neighbors, our friends, or our other countries.